Theological education should be affordable. Seminary students should not have to take out tens of thousands of dollars in student loans to train for the ministry. At Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary, our students pay a base of $75 per credit hour and a $375 per semester fee. For more information on how you can receive informed scholarship with Pastoral Heart, check out our website, cbtseminary.org. Covenant Podcast exists to equip listeners with theological content from a 1689 Baptist perspective. We pray you find this resource edifying, faithful to Scripture, and Christ-exalting. Now, let's get started. Welcome to the Covenant Podcast. Jimmy Johnson here with my co-host, Austin McCormick. We are going to be discussing the concept of biblical repentance. And I'm going to be interviewing Austin on this subject. But to start us off, I want to read a key text when thinking through this subject. And it's Psalm 51 verses 1 through 7. David writes, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And of course, the, the background here is, is David really being confronted with and, and responding to that confrontation of the sin that he committed with Bathsheba. Um, particularly the sin of adultery, but also having Uriah murdered. And that that's a helpful starting point for what we're going to be talking about. So I'm going to let Austin start us off by defining the doctrine. So how, how should we define repentance, Austin? Yeah, uh, I'll start by answering uh, that question by using John Owen and James P. Boyce and what they have written about repentance. John Owen asks the following question in a catechism that he wrote in the second question, what is repentance? And the answer is godly sorrow for every known sin committed against God with a firm purpose of heart to cling to him for the future in the killing of sin, the quickening of all graces to walk before him in newness of life. James P. Boyce, one of the first Southern Baptist presidents, writes this about repentance. The seat of true repentance is in the soul. It is not of itself the mere intellectual knowledge of sin, nor the sorrow that accompanies it, nor the changed life which flows from it, but it is the soul's understanding of its wicked character and the determination to forsake sin which flows from it. Secondly, he writes that true repentance is inconsistent with the continuance in sin because of abounding grace. And thirdly, he writes that true repentance consists of mental and spiritual emotion and not of outward self-imposed chastisement. Even the pious life and devotion to God which follow are described not as repentance, but as fruits met for repentance. So as I have defined, tried to define biblical repentance using John Owen and James P. Poyce. Uh, Here is what is important for you to know. Biblical repentance is a godly sorrow for sinning against God first. Secondly, biblical repentance is not just the knowledge that you are a sinner. Uh, It's not just a mere intellectual thing that's in your mind. Thirdly, biblical repentance is an understanding with godly fear of your sinfulness or your condition of being a sinner in rebellion against God. And fourthly, biblically repentance, biblical repentance does not allow for continuance in sin. 
And fifthly, I might add, biblical repentance is a turning to Christ, and it, it is itself uh, an act of, of faith. So that is, that's how I would begin this conversation in talking about uh, repentance. Well, I, I think that both Boyce and, and John Owen give us, give us a very helpful starting point. And just because we are Reformed Baptists, I thought I'd, or, or particular Baptists for those that are truly Reformed. Um, the Baptist Catechism says, what is repentance unto life? And it's very similar to what Owen says because Owen is a Baptist, right? Repentance unto life is a saving grace, whereby a sinner out of a true sense of his sins and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ does with grief and hatred of sin, turn from it unto God with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. So I, I think one helpful point that, that the catechism draws out that the other two guys didn't state, but most definitely agree, is that repentance is a saving grace. That repentance, much like faith, is, is a grace of God wrought by the person and work of the Holy Spirit. So having said that, though, could, could you help our listeners see kind of how the, the word repentance shows up within the scriptures and how we derive our doctrine from from that word that we see both the Hebrew word and and the Greek word. So there are multiple words contextually that convey the idea of repentance. But if we were to look at how uh, our English Bibles translate the word repent, uh, there are two words used in the New Testament. Uh, one of them is metanoeo, and one of them is metanoia. Uh, the BDAG dictionary defines the root of these words with the following meanings. First, to change one's mind, or second, to feel remorse, repent, or to be converted. Uh, two words are also used in the Old Testament for our English word repent. The first one is shuv. Uh, the Halo dictionary defines shuv as to turn around to repent, to bring back, to refresh, or to refute. And just to give an example of where this word shuv is used over and over again, in the book of Ruth, whenever Naomi was ready to return to Bethlehem, Naomi told Ruth to turn back multiple times in chapter one. Uh, the word that's being used there is shuv, uh, to turn back to Moab. So this is the word that's primarily used for repentance in the Old Testament, but the other one uh, is Nacham, uh, Nun, Chet, Mem. Uh, and so Halot defines it as to be regretful, to be sorry, or to console, console oneself. So um, repentance is a 180 degree turning. Uh, it is a changing of your mind instead of loving your sins and hating God. You repent or change your mind, and as you turn 180, degree, 180 degrees, you now hate your sins and you love God. So as we mentioned earlier with uh, the comment that Jimmy made, this is a grace wrought by the Holy Spirit. This is something that he is doing in his people as they turn to God in faith. So I like this short phrase because it helps exp explain all three ideas of how repentance is used uh, with these words, a changing of your mind, a turning around or turning back and a godly regretfulness or a godly sorrow. Amen. And, and now that you've shown us what words we, we derive this, this theological concept of, of repentance from, can, can you just go through the scriptures and show us how this, this doctrine that we've defined and that we've kind of drawn out of the words of, of scripture, can you show us where, where we encounter this in scripture? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm sure there's probably some other scriptures that you can think of and some other usages to talk about repentance, but I will give uh, three ways to talk about repentance. And first, uh, in scripture, we see that repentance is a command to every sinner 
that brings about conversion. Uh, repentance is a command to every sinner that brings about conversion. Acts 3.19 says, Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. Mark 1.15, uh, after Jesus had come into the region of Galilee, he was saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Acts 17.30 says the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. And then Luke 13, 3 says, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Do you have any further thoughts on, on that before I move on? Okay. Well, uh, so first we've seen that repentance is a command to every sinner. Second, we see that repentance is a gift given to some sinners. More specifically, these are sinners that the Father has given to the Son for eternal life. Uh, John 17, 1 through 3 says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I'm quoting those verses to show you that those whom the father has given to the son will have eternal life. And um, they will be the ones that are also given this gift of repentance. In second Timothy two twenty five correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. So repentance is a command given to every sinner, but repentance is also a gift given to the people of God. It is something that God grants. Acts 5.31, God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. God is the one that gives repentance. In Acts eleven eighteen, 18, when they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. So God gives repentance to Israel. He grants repentance to the Gentiles and he grants repentance to the people that may perhaps grant repentance to the people that seem like they are the enemies of God. So the mystery of the gospel is that all sinners are commanded to repent, and yet God grants some repenters, or some sinners repentance. Um, I use this illustration. When you ask an animal lover if they prefer dogs or cats, they might wittingly respond to you by saying yes. If you ask a foodie if they want cake or pie for dessert, they might just say yes. And similarly, when someone asks us if repentance is a command or a gift, we say yes. So we cannot mistake or deny either of these truths. Any comments, thoughts so far? Okay. Lastly, um, and I'm sure we could talk about other ways that repentance is necessary, but uh, thirdly, repentance is necessary for believers for our sanctification. First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, in that verse, the word repentance is not there. We are not biblicists. The idea is certainly contained within that text, confessing our sins to God. Um, Revelation 2, 5, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first, if not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. He's writing to Christians there. Psalm 32, 5, David writing, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin, Selah. So again, David, a believer there, confessing his sins. And then the verses that Jimmy has already read to you, David, a believer in his sin, uh, in the context of sinning with and against Bathsheba and Uriah, uh, writes, against you, 
you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. So Christians need to repent as well for their sanctification and conforming to the image of Christ. Martin Luther's first of his 95 thesis says, our Lord and master Jesus Christ willed that the whole life of believers should be repentance. Um, having demonstrated it from scripture, I, I think that, that I know we discuss not discussing defending the doctrine, but I, I think it would be worth to explore it because as as Martin Luther said, we're the Christian life is to be a life of of daily repentance. It's to be continued throughout all of life, and and there are some within easy believism circles and things like that 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 tend to reject the the need for repentance, or or even some extreme versions of antinomianism would would <laughs> eliminate the need for repentance. So. Could you go ahead and just briefly like defend this doctrine? Of course, we've we've seen where scripture teaches it, but can you can you defend it a little bit more from scripture for those that might have trouble with it? Yeah, so as you said, not everyone who says they have repented necessarily have. Um 2 Corinthians 7 through 10 makes a distinction between biblical repentance or godly repentance and a worldly or a non-biblical repentance. It says, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So there's a distinction between godly grief and godly repentance and uh, a worldly grief that produces death. Um, so there's this external repentance outwardly the person can act as if they are humiliated by their sinfulness but on the inside there is no true sorrow for offending god the creator um an illustration is given of king ahab ahab was the wicked king who was married to jezebel in the old testament and uh, first kings says that king ahab humbled himself before yahweh First Kings 21, verse 29 says, Have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the disaster in his days, but in his son's days, I will bring the disaster upon his house. So outwardly, Ahab humbled himself to the Lord, but inwardly he was unconverted. Um, there's also hypocritical repentance. We're given... An example in the Old Testament of the unbelieving Israelites in the wilderness uh, that manifest this type of hypocritical repentance. Psalm 78 recalls God leading the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage and leading them through the wilderness. So verses 34 through 36 reads, when he killed them, they sought him. They repented and sought God earnestly. They remembered that God was their rock, the most high God, their redeemer, but they flattered him with their mouths. They lied to him with their tongues. So some of these Israelites, the Israelites, they confessed to repent towards God, but inwardly they were flattering him with their mouths. They were lying to him. Their repentance wasn't real. They were unbelievers. And Jude tells us this in the New Testament. Jude 5 says, now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So again, just because someone says they have repented doesn't necessarily mean that they have been given the gift of repentance from God, godly repentance that leads to eternal life. They may feel guilty because they've been caught. They may be like the person that has got their hand in the cookie jar. They wanted the cookie. They're not really sorry that they have uh, not put their hand in the cookie jar. They just are upset that they got caught putting their hand in the cookie jar. They may outwardly humble themselves to God while inwardly playing the hypocrite. 
And this is not true repentance. Thank you for, for fleshing that out a little bit more, because I do think it is essential to note that there are things that are called repentance that aren't actual, true, God-honoring, God-wrought repentance. So with that in mind, let's, let's move in the direction of applying this doctrine and devoting it throughout the Christian life. Can, can you go ahead and do that for us? How, why does this matter and, and how does it impact our lives? Yeah, so I'll give us seven ways to uh, worship God through the doctrine of repentance. First is repentance is important because it ensures us of our salvation. Jesus told us whenever he came in the region of Galilee, repent and believe in the gospel. If we have been given this gift of repentance and if we have repented, it ensures us that we are saved. Secondly, repentance helps us to evangelize unbelievers as we recognize that repentance is a command to all creatures everywhere. Uh, we, as heralder of, heralders of the good news, are calling upon unbelievers to turn from their sins with godly sorrow and change their mind about their sin and about God and to believe in the gospel as they turn away from their wickedness. So repentance helps us to evangelize. Thirdly, repentance helps us to examine professing believers. If someone says they're a follower of Christ and their life is not marked by repentance, and if they are continually, unashamedly, and repetitively waving their fists in opposition towards the God they profess to believe in, we can use this doctrine of repentance to see if they are being sanctified by the Lord. Fourth, the doctrine of repentance is necessary to preach the full counsel of God. Uh, I would encourage you that if the church that you go to does not preach this doctrine or does not call upon you to repent and turn from sin, uh, the pastor that is preaching before you that doesn't ever preach about sin, you very likely don't have a preacher. You have an entertainer. Fifth, the doctrine of repentance is necessary to ensure that you're a member of a Bible-believing church, and this is very similar to the last point. If the doctrine of repentance is not preached from the pulpit and not lived out by the members in the congregation, it could identify that you are not part of a true church of Christ. Instead, the church that you go to may just be a religious club of some sorts. Six, the doctrine of repentance sh shows the merciful and forgiving characteristics of God. When someone turns from their sins, we see God's steadfast loving kindness to embrace the sinner instead of casting them out and punishing them for what they deserve. So when someone repents, we see the grace of God. We see his forgiveness. We see his mercy. And lastly, the doctrine of repentance gives glory to God. Um, God is the one who grants such repentance in the hearts of believers. When we repent, we give God praise because without him, we can do nothing. So these are some ways that we can praise God through considering this important doctrine you know those points and and you have two related to to church life as a as it relates to this doctrine and and ensuring that you're a member of a true church and i'm just reminded of some conversations that i've had even with my own members as they they have invited people to to our church and and people have refused to come because they had heard that I ask or I, I compel people to repent of their sins and, and to strive toward holiness, of course, out of gratitude for the redemption that they've received in the Lord Jesus Christ, um, as well as understanding that it is a gift. But I do think that this idea of repentance, and, and I don't just think it, it's biblical, um, this idea of repentance is so contrary to the, the fallen human nature 
And it's so contrary to the licentiousness of our age um, and of our country where, where all that's to be pursued is the fulfillment of one's base desires. And this idea of repentance and, and mortification of sin as, a, as it relates to, to repentance is so, so contrary to everything that our people are encountering on a day-to-day basis. So I really appreciate that you, you've taken the time to, to prepare this, this, this and answer these questions that I've had, as well as to, to, I know you've talked with your church about these things and other churches about these things. And I thank you for passing it on to our listeners and to myself. Are, are there any other applications or points that you would like to leave our audience with on the subject of repentance. Well, thank you um, for for talking about repentance, and and I I will exhort you, Christian, to to continually um, repent of of sin and to turn back into Christ. And for the unconverted, if you happen to stumble upon our podcast, I <laughs> I exhort you to repent and believe the gospel for your salvation. Go ahead, Austin. Yeah, I just want to, in preparation for this, I do want to read the last paragraph as an encouragement. Uh, Christians, as you repent, I want to remind you that you are no longer under the condemnation of the law. Uh, your heavenly Father shows his displeasure towards you whenever, you're sin- whenever you do sin, but he does so because he loves you. He will not abandon you and cast you down to hell. He desires that you would turn from your sins and be restored to him. So the gospel is where your hope lies. What Jesus did on the cross is where your hope lies. Turn from your sins and rest in the finished work of Jesus. And with that said, I just want to say amen. And to our our listeners, both Austin and I wish you grace and peace. For additional content, check out our blog ministry at covenantconfessions.com. Also, keep up with our social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Next, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. Lastly, thank you for listening to the Covenant Podcast. Grace and peace to you.